our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. You, you know the prayer, right? But I, I like to look at it and go, oh, Dad, Dad, who is above everything. You're enthroned and nothing can move you, Dad. And your name is perfect, your character, everything about you. You've never lied to me. You've never lied. You're incapable of lying. It's just you can't. God can't. Paradox. He can't. He's perfect. Your kingdom comes. What's holy in, in your righteousness, when I recognize that you're perfect and you are who you say you are, the direct result, the reflex of that in holy moment is that your kingdom comes. The kingdom of God is among you, Jesus said. And when we hallow his name and believe he is who he said is it, he is, his kingdom comes and fills you and rules in you, touches you, changes your mind. When you look to God as dad and recognize he's bigger than everything else and his name is holy and he's, he's, his character is perfect, the result is his kingdom manifests in your life. Right? Isn't that what happens when we get saved? We come to God and go, God, you're dad. You're daddy. You're Abba Father. You love me. You adore me. You adopted me. You picked me up as a leprous piece of mud on the ground, and you made me new. You chose me. You grafted me in. I had no worth at all. I was nothing but a liability. But you chose me, Dad. And if you're for me, who can be against me? Because you're in heaven. You're in heaven and nothing is above you, Lord. Oh, Dad, you're above all things. Incredible. Your name is perfect. Your kingdom has come. And the result of that is I have the heart like your son did that says, hey, this cup of suffering, I'd rather not deal with it because it's sin and I don't like sin, what I'm dealing with, but not my will. Your will be done. Right? That's the result of someone that's seen the kingdom of God manifested is they die to their own desires even at the cost of their flesh and their own rights, just like Jesus did, walking as Jesus walked. Everyone wants to walk on water as Jesus walked, but do you want to walk in the Garden of Gethsemane and be an olive in the oil press and being crushed the Spirit of God might just flow through your life? Now that's walking like Jesus walked. Right on? Some of you have been there. And then you come to find out that God's faithful as he allows each new day to have a need that only he can meet. God, give me this day, this daily bread. Just like you did yesterday, you were faithful to meet my need yesterday, and you'll meet my need today. I remember what you've done for me. That's why you allow my body to be hungry every day, because it's another opportunity to remind me, because I forget, that you're faithful. You're faithful. You, 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 you never... I mean, you take care of the birds of the air, so surely you're going to take care of me. And so God wants us to walk like that. Dad, you're above it all, and you take care of me. But this thing, that this next line here that Jesus speaks, he says, and when you pray, say, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone, what, who is indebted to us? God, forgive us our sins. You know, I've pondered on this where if I'm born again, my sins of the past and today are forgiven. What about my sins of the future? Are they forgiven or am I still working on that? It's done, right? So if my sins are already forgiven, why am I asking God to forgive me? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah? What else? Am I already forgiven for everything I'll ever do? Sure. Yeah. 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 Have you asked to be forgiven? Yeah. When did that happen? Yeah. Okay. So are you forgiven? Are you sure? Amen. I like that answer. <laughs> that can be intimidating. Are you sure? <laughs> Amen. But obviously, we don't want to ask God to forgive us in the sense of like, okay, Jesus, you need to get back on the cross and shed a little bit more blood because this is a big one. 
you know. I know you forgave me for everything I've done, and it was sufficient for that, but I don't know about everything from here on out. But sometimes when we pray, God forgive us, that's what we do. We, we get the idea, well, that's forgiven, and I got a clean slate from here on out. I better walk right or else. No. His blood was shed once and all for the sins of all the world. Everyone. Not everyone has repented and accepted that gift, but what do we, how do we read that verse? And we go, well, there's a connection where it says that we're to ask for our sins to be forgiven, right? God, forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. You know, Jesus said something interesting where he says, if you're standing there worshiping God and you remember that there's someone that has something against you or you have something against someone else, there's some type of division because of sin, drop your gift, stop playing games with God, and go back and make that right. Why? I think he hit a beautiful point where he talked about fellowship, that there's this fellowship that sin, even though our sins have been removed from us and we know we have intimacy and eternal life with God, the truth of it is that sin gets in the way and it blinds us to what we already have. And one of the ways that you know if you are engaged in present fellowship at the Lord's table is if you have a clean bill of health in relationships with people that you know. Because if you don't, then something's clogged. Something's not right in your view of who Jesus is. See, this is what happens. We begin to walk with God. We get intimate relationship with Dad. We get a clear vision of how big he is. We get a surrendered will to him. We start to walk and watch God take care of us and provide for us. We see incredible things happen. But then sometimes we get stuck. We get a flat tire spiritually. We go from this mountaintop incredible walk with God, and then we succumb to the tempter. He comes in, and he gives us that flat tire. How did it happen? We lost sight that our sins are forgiven. That's what happens. You can be forgiven and forget you're forgiven. You've heard of what I call it before, spiritual amnesia. It's what happens. Let me read this to you. You guys don't need to turn there, but I want you just to listen closely to this in 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a bondservant, apostle of Jesus Christ to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Did Peter just call Jesus God? Yeah, he did. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have given have been given us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust did you hear that we get to be partakers in the divine nature of god how awesome is that we get to be like Jesus. We get to be this holy character. It, cutting it to the chase, it's the Holy Spirit, right? He comes to live inside you and walks out this incredible walk with Papa God, just like Jesus did. It's a gift, and it's him. It says, also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, and perseverance godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Here comes the connection. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short sighted even to blindness and has, listen, and has forgotten that he has been cleansed from his old sins. Peter's talking about this incredible, virtuous life of walking with God the Father, walking in this divine power. 
with diligence and knowledge. Knowledge of what? Of the Lord Jesus Christ and brotherly kindness. It says if you are fruitful in these things, if you're fruitful, you won't be barren. But it says he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he's been forgiven. What would you say if I told you that some of us in here that have forgotten we've been forgiven of our sins? Now, I don't mean that you've forgotten that Jesus died on the cross and that his blood was shed for you. You have that knowledge. You know that. That doesn't mean you remember that your sins were forgiven. I'm talking about a knowledge that goes beyond, something that goes beyond the intellect. How you know you're walking in the clear knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and walking in this power and abounding is there's a brotherly kindness. In other words, you know that your sins are forgiven and the byproduct is you have no bitter roots towards anyone in the body of Christ. How about that? Now, how many of you right now think, you don't have to do this, but how many of you think you could raise your hand and go, I have no bitter roots towards anyone? If you want to raise your hand, go ahead. Okay? Not a lot. Now, how many of you go, yeah, I think I do have some bitter roots towards some people. Just raise your hand. More people raising their hand than before. Okay. Thank you for your honesty, by the way. That's how we get free, being real, right? If you're having a bitter root, that means you're walking in spiritual amnesia. That's what we just read. That you're barren. You're barren. And you're not able to pray the Lord's Prayer. Not the prayer of, God, you're holding my sins against me. You're not able to embrace that he's forgiven your sins. You're not able to walk in the freedom and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and all this virtue and faith and holiness and divine nature. You can't if you're holding a bitter root because it's a byproduct. You've lost sight of the cross. That's the whole point in praying this prayer. It's not to re-crucify Christ every time we, we pray this. It's, it's not like a rosary sentence that we're supposed to take. Okay, Luke 11, we got to pray the Lord's Prayer. No, 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 no. There's a spiritual message in this that every day, like we have our daily bread, every day we acknowledge it's the blood. That's how we overcome the enemy. It's the blood of the Lamb. It's that he shed his blood for my sins and washed away. And the byproduct that I'm walking in that, the reflex of it, is I have no bitter roots towards anyone. I don't stand in hypocrisy worshiping God, though I know I have unforgiveness for someone. I think this is a plague in the church today. I do. I think Matthew 18, that if you have a problem with your brother, you go to them, to re- not to prove your point, but to resolve. If that doesn't work, you take a second person, you take a third person. I think it's one of those pages that's pulled out in most Bibles, metaphorically. We, we ignore it. Well, I'm not going to them. They're not going to listen anyway. They just don't, they don't get it. No, they don't get it. We don't get it. See, if I see what Jesus did for me, that while I was yet a sinner, he died for me, I don't need them to get it. Right? Because I didn't get it at all. I was spitting on him and helping pound the nails in his hands and feet while he was dying for me and loving me. I'm just not going to die for these people. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, they don't get it. You kill the prophets, I'm done with you guys. Dad, let's go to another planet and start over. Right? That's what I would have done. But when you get a hold of that, man, it's amazing how you really can turn the other cheek. How you can love someone like they've repented before they repent. It's incredible. It's the byproduct that you're not just praying some prayer in Luke 11. You're getting the core of what it's saying. Every day I'm walking, thank you that you forgive me of my sins, and I know that I get it because I've forgiven those who sinned against me. This is the roadblock. This is a huge roadblock in the body of Christ, one that's ignored. It's a self-righteousness that we mix in with our Christianity. It's called yeast. The Pharisees, they brought this yeast, this legalism. The Judaizers did this. They followed Paul around. Yes, we believe Jesus is the Messiah, and and it's the blood of the Lamb, and, and that's sufficient, but you still need to do this. It's mixing in, and we do the same thing when we have bitter roots. So tonight, what are we going to do? We're going to call down bitter roots. 
it's not enough that we just raise our hand and go, yeah, that's me. I have a disease. Can we sing another worship song, please? Right? But that's what we do. I'm sick. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a hypocrite. But hey, it's okay. God loves me anyway. Yeah, yeah, God loves you. Yeah. I mean, he so loved the world. He loves everybody. That's not relevant. The point is, I listen, folks, I don't want to waste one more day in mediocrity. Not one more day in just half-hearted Christianity. Not one more day in partial knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to waste one more day just settling for the 60-fold blessing. I want the 100-fold blessing. I want all that God has for me. I want all the power he wants to give me, all the anointing he wants to give me, all the trials that he sees I need to have. All he wants to give me, I'll take it. I want it. I need it. I might only have one week left on this earth. How about you? Could be. This week I've been thinking about how many spouses I know that lost their spouse and go, oh man, if I'd have known I had one more week with them, I would have kissed them more, I would have hugged them more, I wouldn't have argued as much, I would would have made a big deal out of certain things. I would have lived differently if I really realized how precious the time I had was. We don't really value things until they're taken away. That's how pathetic we are. (laughs) Right? So God's given us this gift of time. I've been thinking about it a lot since I hit 50. (laughs) That's what happens, you know. If you're new, you're going, he's that old. Yeah. Pastor Ty lets me, reminds me every day. Thank you very much, brother. But the older you get, the more, I only got so much time. I want to make the most of it. Whether you're 50 or 15, tomorrow's promised to no man. Right? So if you really want to say, yes, I want to go hardcore with God. I want the fullness of God in my life. I want... The book of Acts is still being written. It never really ended as you look at the last, the last page because you're supposed to be writing it. Your life is supposed to be writing it. Is your life worthy to be the next chapter in the book of Acts? Think about it. Look at your prayer life. Look at the anointing. Look at the visions that you have, the ear that you hear the voice of God, the fruit, the salvation around you, people being convicted of sin. You know, is your life worthy to add on to the book of Acts? It should be, because you are a partaker in the divine nature, right? That's what makes it worthy. It's not you. It's the divine nature moving through you. What will cause this, yes, gross, spiritual constipation? Bitter roots. But that's not the root. The bitter root is the symptom, Sounds like a contradiction. It's not. The bitter root that you're having with someone is the symptom that you have forgotten that your sins have been forgiven. The bitter root is the symptom that you've taken your eyes off of Jesus and off the cup and off the bread. And that's why we have it when we gather every time we come. Not for religious purposes because Jesus says you need this. There's a spiritual war going on to have you forget about the blood and, and the body. And if, when you do that, it all goes downhill from there once you forget that. Once you take your, oh, yeah, I've had communion. Yeah, I did that. I did that in my confirmation. Don't we, why do we have to do it every week? You don't have to do it every week. You just need to do it every day. Every day. Every day. Your blood. What you did for me, I should go to hell. Man, all of a sudden, the part, you're a partaker. The divine nature flows through you. And all of a sudden, the world looks at you and go, man, you're like one of the apostles. How incredible is that? I mean, Andrew, your mom is getting affected, right? Your mom is getting affected by your life since God delivered you from a demon. Wow, how awesome is that? This young man is just like coming to prayer every day and seeking the face of God. And we remember the, remember the conference. It was just an incredible deliverance in a moment. It was powerful. And since then, a mom that's hard is getting torn in the presence of God. It is awesome. We should all have those testimonies in our life. Every one of us in this room should have that kind of testimony. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but in, you know what I'm saying? It should be on the calendar this month. Something, 
Something where you go, yep, raise the dead today. <laughs> Some guy's leg grew back. This woman had arthritis for the last 20 years, and God healed her. You know, this marriage, they were in divorce court, and something happened, and they repented. Now they're counseling other couples in marriage. It's incredible just because I talked to them about how God restores. I mean, we should have these testimonies. And I'm telling you, what will unlock it is the blood that washes away sin. It opens the door. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to thank God for the blood that he shed that washes away our sin. We're going to thank him for the atonement that took place. We're going to confess where there's a need for better roots to be laid down. Right now, you have a name in your mind. You know if you ran in the Publix, you'd go down the other aisle. You know you would, right? Because they don't get it. You've tried these. They don't get it. You need to repent of that tonight. Confess it to someone. And then go to them, write a letter, and say, hey, listen, I want to know, let you know I've been holding on forgiveness, and I've been a real hypocrite in my Christianity. Please forgive me. I'm sorry for that lack of witness of who Jesus is. I'm sorry. They might laugh at you. They might say, I'm sorry, too. It doesn't really matter what they do. It doesn't matter at all. But if you want to go hardcore with God and you want to walk in this anointing and you want your life to be the next chapter in the book of Acts, then you need to acknowledge the blood was sufficient for your sin and just as God in Christ forgave you, forgive one another. This sounds so elementary, and yet, folks, we don't have it down. I lay this before you tonight. It's between you and your God now what you do with it. If you're willing to repent and soften your hearts, I'm going to open up in prayer this time. We're going to take the next 15 minutes or so, and, and I'm going to ask you to turn to a few folks next to you. There's way too many people for us to have corporate prayer and, and hear one another and really be fruitful. Um, bittersweet that we've gotten that big, but we need to adjust. So what we're going to do is we're going to break up into some groups of three or four and no more. And, um, and it's important because if it's going to be a fruitful 15 minutes, it's not a time to become therapy session or gossip session. It's a time to say, we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray. We're not going to talk to each other. We're going to pray. And we're going to confess our sins to one another. We're going to, we're going to thank God together. We're going to be in agreement with one another that the blood has washed away my sin, that the consequences of my sin were put upon the body of Jesus. He who knew no sin became sin, that I might become a partaker in the divine nature of God. Right? And begin to give God praise for that and then lay down that bitter root. I confess that as sin. I renounce the words, the gossip that I've spoken about that person. It was sin. I confess it as sin. I thank you that you washed it away. And now I'm not going to confess it. I'm going to make restitution. I'm going to go to that person and make it right tonight. If not tonight, then tomorrow. I'm going to deal with this. And I'm going to get on to adding that chapter to the book of Acts. Amen? If you're new here tonight, you're probably so glad you came. <laughs> Before we pray, guys, I love you. I love you dearly. So blessed to be part of this church and this body and what the Holy Spirit is doing. It is a privilege to be part of an outpouring, a last day's outpouring of what God is doing. And he's pouring out. The wind is blowing. But family, we have to set our sail. We have to respond not just hearers of the word. We need to be doers of the word. Father God, I pray blessing upon your sons and daughters in this place. May you grant us the gift of humility. Grant us the gift of repentance and turning to you. We thank you, Lord, for the holy blood of the Lamb of God that was shed for the sins of mankind. Thank you that you died for our sin. While we were sinning and cursing you and screaming crucify, Lord, you loved us. We're worthy of damnation, and you've given us royalty, Lord. 
We ask your blessing as we would be, as you called us to be, Jesus, a house of prayer. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to bring unity in this place as we offer our thoughts, our words. We offer this time to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, amen. Amen.